three o'clock. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm not sure uh, on Hopin if I can see the participants. It looks like we might have over 450 uh, people logged in, which is a fantastic number. Um, I said good afternoon, but this could be evening or morning, depending on your time zone. Really excited to be here today. First, want to thank Enrique Rubio and Matt Burns of Hacking HR for this opportunity and putting together this fantastic event, this global online event. Um, today, we're speaking about understanding organization uh, network analysis and the implications for work. Uh, my name is Donna Schaff. I'm the HR business partner for Church and Dwight, a global CPG company, and I'm your moderator. Uh, we have four panelists today, all expert ONA. Uh, people who either have PhDs or a background um, utilizing ONA or just in the infancy stages of this journey. And they have a lot of feedback uh, to share with all of you. Uh, so let me introduce everyone. We have Michal Grachtin. Michal is an organizational psychologist with a network perspective. In her academic lifetime, Michal has researched leadership in newcomers networks and has a practitioner has used ONA to help companies through organizational development processes. Currently, Michal is the CEO of Starlinks, a platform using ONA to build social capital in companies. Uh, we also have David White, uh, who leads people analytics function at LinkedIn, where they are increasingly using ONA as a way to help their employees be happier at work. And last but not least, we have Ben Waver. Ben is a president and co-founder of Humanize, a workplace analytics company spun out of his PhD research at MIT. Uh, his book, People Analytics, was published by the Financial Times Press in 2013. So we'll get started with the first question. We should really start with, you know, what is uh, ONA? Uh, and I'm gonna give this question to Michal and the rest can chime in as well. But what really is organization network analysis? What does that mean to you? What is the value and why should we use it? Thank you, Dana, and uh, I join in with thanking Enrique before I, uh, I answer your question because this is the top notch. I uh, really had off Enrique. Uh, so, um, so diving into ONA and uh, one of my on, on my favorite topics um, for me, ONA is like imagine you have a toolbox, and this toolbox has analytical procedures that know how to process relational data. And this relational data can be so many things, right? It's not one thing that ONA is every time. It's this amazing toolbox that you can use with different relational data to create insights um, at different levels. And that's one of the things that I love about ONA is that you take the network data, the relational data, and you can produce insights for individuals looking at individuals, looking at subgroups, looking within subgroups, between subgroups, looking at organizations as a whole, looking at organizations with other organizations and looking at ecosystems of companies working together. So really it's just endless once you understand um, the, the lens. And that's for me what ONA is, is before the analytics, it's a lens that if you adopt it, it allows you to look at the same things that you looked at before, but just completely understanding them differently. Um, and just as an example, you know, uh, newcomers. So I researched newcomers and I said, you know, as a newcomer, you get into a company and you get orientation and you get all these things taught to you and you don't know how to make sense of all of these things yet. You get all this information in, but you're you're not still understanding how to make sense of all of it. And really, we know for years now that insiders are the best mechanisms to get in newcomers in. So really, my research was flipping it and looking and saying, how can we fo focus on insiders rather than on the newcomers? What tools do we need to give insiders to help them when a newcomer comes in weave them more effectively into the network? How can we better connect the newcomers faster and more effectively, not just by one mentor who we believe, but with using data and understanding what are the uh, connections that will help this newcomer uh, have 
su succeed faster, which is good for the newcomer because it builds our, our sense of ability and it's good for the company because we get talent adapted faster. So this is just one example for me, but it's like, um, it's like the never ending possibilities once you start looking at the world this way. Um, and why would we use it? I think especially today, especially today, when we talk about complexity and uncertainty and uh, rapid change, we can no longer rely on individuals. Our strength is in our connections with one another. We talk human capital. We talk in atoms. Each atom holds knowledge and experience and skills. But the potential of this atom is only come to be realized when it's connected and co-creating value with others. And really, we get to a world where collaboration and interconnectivity are a must for businesses to survive. And I think um, once you understand that this relationship thing <laughs> is critical for the business and you want a lens or a tool to address it, to promote it, to touch it, then you just, you know, you need to put the, the box is there and the key is the lens, right? Once you, you adopt the lens, the box is open and you can just dig in and start doing great things. I hope I answered the, what our name and why should we use it? <laughs> Thank you, great response. Uh, ben, do you want to add to Michal's response? I, I mean, I think it was a, a really complete, um, I, I do want to point out to folks, because again, we have what, another 53 minutes left. Um, no one's going to come out of this being an expert in organizational network analysis. And it's um, obviously a pretty large field and it's a newer field. Um, in the academic literature, if you look into it, it's typically called social network analysis. Um, and I would highly recommend that if you come out of this this, uh, this discussion, you're still interested in the topic and you want to learn more about it, um, and really into the, especially the, the actual methodology. Um, there's a book called Social Network Analysis Hand, the Social Network Analysis Handbook by uh, John Scott. Um, that would be great uh, to pick up. David, do you have any feedback? By Borgatti, which I think also gets. Uh, um, there are there are numerous resources today, but I, I and I completely agree with you, Ben. I think that one of the beauties of ONA is its simplicity. It seems so, you know, you you see the network and it's intuitive and you you feel so simple, but yet the details within it to understand what the line means, in what direction it goes, what what do these things mean at the end, and how we can apply what they mean into the business. I think it's really, um, it's a thing to learn. I, I think Donna, the only thing I would add, uh, I, I perfectly said, I think what gets really interesting from really getting into the practitioner space is this uh, one step deeper than McCaw went was essentially the ability to see this data in a different way. So that's lens that we're talking about. It, it, and it, this behavioral lens that we're seeing is so different than the way we look at, at data typically within an organization. When you talk about this network analysis, um, you know, you you talk about behaviors and you talk about programs. The programs we we put into place within organizations, the point of those is to change behaviors. And network analysis gives you this incredible uh, view into how behaviors are shifting in ways that you can't see otherwise, uh, period. And so I think that for us is really this, really looking at the program saying, what is what is the ROI of this program based on the actual outcomes, the behavioral outcomes that I'm that I'm effectuating via this program is really crucial for uh, ONA within organizations as well. David, can you expand on that and um, give an example where you're applying it today? And where you are um, in the journey. I can give an example. We're starting to apply it. Um, mm -hmm. Really, for uh, I mean, I, there's a million of them. One of them would be uh, specifically around our learning and development programs, right? When we have manager trainings, when we have uh, different trainings that we're focused on specific actions that we want individuals to take within the organization, um, us being able to say what are the things 
that we would like the managers or the individuals to do as a result of this specific training. And then we can look at those things specifically. Now, to be very clear, we're not looking at individuals, we're looking at cohorts. So I want to be really clear that, that, that we're not, I'm not trying to focus on, you know, there's no tracker on, on the back of your head that I'm trying to figure out exactly what's going on. But I want to look at generally what is happening as a result of the, this cohort of this class and this training and, and what the behavioral change was. Another, uh, another really interesting thing that, um, that we're doing that I think is I'm super pumped about is uh, pulling in uh, survey data with some of this network, network analysis data and pulling together so I can see what did I answer, how happy am I working at a certain place. Um, and I can then, then I can look and say, if, if this person is extremely happy working here, this group of people are extremely happy working here, what are the behavioral things that they're doing that are different from those who are not quite as happy working here? And so you can start to get, again, back to what Michal was saying, this, this incredible lens. It's a different lens by which to look at the organization um, and uh, seemingly limitless possibilities uh, with regard to that. Michal, you know, can you? Yeah, he's, and David, you're talking about, you know, uh, putting together, uh, integrating sets of data, and and um, we we always uh, mix the relational data with some what we call attribute data, or uh, and attribute data can be also your emotions. But we're also, you know, around us is a coronavirus, which uh, contagious is uh, for me in my head, and I I hear you, David, and I say. Another lens is to think about happiness as contagious or this not being happy, you know, and seeing, okay, where are the areas where I need to put special oh, yeah. attention because if this starts to spread, you know, um, I'm not talking about putting employees in, uh, you know, with masks, but I'm talking about the same, it's the same concept of contagious. Uh, emotions are contagious as well. So it's interesting to also be able to think or predict ahead how is this gonna ripple the good and the, and the not so good? Love it. Um, Michal, can you answer the question as well of what, can you give um, the participant an example of how you've applied ONA? Where yes. have you seen it be successful? Yes, gladly. So I'm um, actually gonna bring a, a, an example uh, hot from the oven. Uh, um, so we use uh, ONA to uh, help build social capital, help people, people build their social capitals within their company and, you know, uh, within the company or a different bounded network. Sometimes we don't start with the entire company. Sometimes we bound the network smaller. Uh, so we're working with a client right now that wants to promote a culture of partnerships and collaboration uh, within the organization. And CEO decided that, um, Measurement is going to be a key part. If you want things to change, you want to measure them. Um, and not only um, that, we start. We decided to start with the leadership network. So it's a global uh, leadership network. And to build it, to build management as a network, to build leadership, not as leaders, but as a network of leadership uh, leading the company together. So... Uh, what we did, we used uh, what uh, we used. Well, we know, you know, after our conversation, Ben, it's hard for me I, I, to to use active or passive, but active ONA. Uh, but no, but, you know, I went back and I'm like in research as well. There wasn't uh, active. We talk about what what questions we're using, but using uh, active uh, ONA, we ask four questions. Uh, everyone in the in the leadership. Uh, in the boundary of the leadership, the, uh, the global leadership. And these four questions are very short and very intentional, um, and they're meant as a part of the intervention. So when we ask people a question, they get to think about the, the answers, and we start, we ignite the process of thinking about social capital and thinking about creating those co-create, co-value create value co-creation relations with others. So the questions are very intentional, four questions, we give it to all of them, and then we give them uh, their data. Each manager get their own personal network with their insights on the constraints and the opportunities in their network. 
And because it's a developmental growth mindset, the data is personal. So they don't have to share their insights with anyone. And we trained the HR to be the experts in, in understanding the network, in giving uh, tips for improvement, in, in leading this. And we gave people the option to talk to them. It was amazing what happened after people got their data. Suddenly, the room of the VPHR became the place you go to, to take your data to and talk about what does it, what does it mean for me? And how can I better build my network? And how can I better create my relations across the leadership team? And, and it's not the data. It's the data leading to these conversations, to these discussions, to these thoughts of how can I do things differently? And not only that, having answering the questions, people started using the jargon of the questions of recognizing one another for creating value for one another, even outside the system itself. So we're taking this for a year, and there are moments of recognition, those four simple questions throughout the year. So I'll see, we just started, and this is the first, as I said, it's hot from the oven. These conversations are happening now. Um, and it's just, it's great to see how um, this network data can ignite conversations about something that is really difficult, relationships. And it's not easy uh, to have those discussions. So it's really for me, uh, how I like to use ONA is to use it as a tool to ignite the collaboration and the change in the relationships, in the value creation between people. The behaviors, like David said, the behaviors of sharing knowledge, of going to one another, of asking help, of doing those relational stuff. Great. Um, I know um, some people refer to active or passive ONA. Um, so Ben, the quiz yeah. question really is for you to, to, to kick it off. Can you describe behavioral ONA, okay. uh, where some people um, describe it as a passive ONA, and how has that been effective uh, for you, and where have you applied it? Yeah, I'll, I'll start off with my, again, my, my grumpy um, academic hat. Um, and, and again, people can feel free to discount, because uh, it's it, not always the most practical, but I do think the terminology matters. And that I like, uh, you know, some folks are using uh, the terms active versus passive. Subjectively, I feel like there's a um, there's just a, a qualitative difference in terms of uh, like a negative or positive implication of both of those. Also, they're not very descriptive. Like active is typically like again survey based, which is again like Michal was just talking about useful in a variety of circumstances. Um, then there's other side which has has been referred to as passive, but I prefer the term behavioral. ONA, which is around using um, typically quantitative behavioral data um, to look at how people interact and collaborate. Again, think about email, chat, meeting data, increasingly also sensor data about the real world, about who's actually spending time with who in person. And using that to look at the communication patterns and relationships between people to look at this um, uh, obviously continuously evolving um, set of relationships between folks. Um, again, this is that, that's the sort of data, just importantly, that companies already have today. Again, if you work in an organization, you have email data, right? You'll probably increasingly also have sensor data, and we've just seen that. Um, of course, this data is constantly coming in. There's large volumes of data. It, when it comes to things like sensor data about the real world, it tends to get quite hard to understand um, without um, sort of, again, if I say with anything, there's, of course, tools that help you do that. but. Um, the data about the real world interaction, even though like us talking in person tends to be incredibly predictive of a whole variety of outcomes, it tends to be a lot harder uh, to understand that yourself without um, different software. The things that you get from that data, again, are this very rapidly evolving, continuous um, you know, view on the real pattern of relationships and communication um, within an organization. What you don't get, which is important, is sort of the affective qualitative nature of those ties. So you can tell, you know, here's how much engineering talks to sales, here's how that changes over time, here's how central these teams are, here's how um, clustered the organization is, essentially like siloing. Again, mathematically measuring how siloed the organization is, it's doable. 
However, you can't really say, are these positive interactions? Are these negative? Are these trusted relationships? Are they advice? And again, a lot of things that Michal was, was talking about, that's how you have to, have to get at that, right? Is you do need to use those surveys to get that kind of view. Um, but again, it depends on the application. If, uh, like David was talking about, um, you really want to get into, um, you know, using behavioral data, also mashing that up with outcome data to look at, you know, as, for example, centrality or cohesion or one of these other network metrics increases within a team with it, uh, or on an individual basis, how does it relate to outcomes? Um, that's obviously a lot of what, um, where the power comes is not just looking at the behavioral data um, or behavioral ONA, or even, uh, again, with survey-based ONA by itself, it's combining that with outcome data to really make it very relevant to decisions that the organization is making uh, right now. Anyone else want to chime in? I think I think uh, you know. For me, after we we talked in the and and this discussion went up, I got to think about it more. And again, I I I don't think academia research also said active data. I think it's really uh, something that came about after in the in the practitioners world. Um, and I think it's really important if there is one thing that I'd like to kind of clarify when I talk about ONA. And like I said before, we talk about relational data. And relational data can be various things. And it really depends. And, and that's why it's not either this or either that. It's it, sometimes the combination of the two can predict the best. Um, it's, it's really about understanding what do you want to do? What do you want to do? Mm -hmm. um, do you want to, for me, again, I want, I know building social capital through creating a culture of collaboration. That's, that's, it's very clear. And so once you have something so clear, everything else kind of builds from there, which relations should, which relational data is relevant, which method of collecting this data is relevant. How am I going to communicate? Who is going to see what type of data? Um, um, what initiatives are we going to launch? Are we ready to launch from that data? Or if, I, if we're not ready to act on the data, maybe we shouldn't, you know, um, it, it's, so it's really, that's what ONA for me is a part of a pro like using this toolbox is a part of a bigger process that you're trying to achieve. And then this bigger process is what helps you focus within this world of relational data all of these options that this toolbox is bringing for you is to pick and choose the right tools for the mission you want to accomplish. So, um, and, and so for me, it's not about passive or active or this or that. It's really about the relate, looking and seeing what relationships matter, what relational elements matter. And just to give an example out of the world completely, you can even talk about skills as a relation, right? Me and you having, Ben and I connected as having both O and A and use that as a tie and looking at how, you know, the relation becomes the skill that we share. It's a shared skill. So you can think about it in so many ways. And that's, I think it's really important that you'll know what you want to do. And then the rest will, will, will follow through from that and you'll know which way to go. And it's not either that or this, you may need to bring both to accomplish what you want to accomplish. Great, thank you. Um, ben, so, you wanna say something? I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, I, I did wanna point out, I think there is an important point there that I just think bears emphasis, right? Um, I, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had where people um, you know, come to me and they're like, you know, we think your technology is really cool or we want to apply ONA. We don't, we just know we need to do it. We don't know where we need to apply it. We just know it's important. Um, and that's a really bad way to start, just to be clear. Like, don't do that, okay? Because you're going to, you're going to get some, again, if you're whether using surveys or behavioral data, what you'll get, you'll get some pretty graphs, right? You'll get some pretty graphs and some things that look pretty and people ooh and hour with it and then nothing will change. And then when it comes time to actively, um, you know, whether trying to implement something based on network analysis, right? You say, well, what you, you know, what we did is we looked at the relationship between, um, you, you know, again, cohesion within teams and 
performance, and we see the most cohesive teams sell the most, and they can get up. Right? Um, and so based on that, we want to implement a new training program, and we're going to measure the impact of a couple different programs, and we want to see across the organization what impact it has. Right? Well, I can pretty much guarantee you that if your only um, ONA experience in the organization up to that point is, hey, we looked at some data, ran some surveys, and we saw some pretty graphs, nothing's going to happen. Right? Um, and so really at first, again, I can't emphasize this enough. If it comes to behavioral data, almost any of your companies can guarantee you has the data you would need to get started. If it comes to surveys, those are things you can also do. You can work with Michal, you can work with a number of people to, to do that sort of thing. Um, but then, in my opinion, it's always most important to start on an initiative or problem that the organization has already identified, right, that has a budget. Um, and I feel like ideally you're using the results of the analysis to influence the program or whatever comes out. Um, but being more realistic, that has occasionally happened in, in my experience. In most cases, though, it, at least, and again, to be fair, I'm working with behavioral data. So, like, one of our customers, you know, $3 billion new company campus and wanted to break down silos and wanted a quantitative way to show that. Okay, so again, you pulled all their email data, face to face communication data, you can measure that with a clustering coefficient um, and look at the changes. But at first, all they were doing was showing the impact of a decision they already made. And that is still valuable, right? Because you know where you're off track, where you're not meaning to change. Um, that gets visibility. That then starts to build the credibility to say we should use these analytics, we should use them today to help plan proactively the next intervention. But it's really typically hard to start there because it's not saying you can't. I've had customers do it, but if again the way that people make these kind of decisions today, whether it's you know, what leadership and development program, I mean, David, you can talk about this stuff, but with a lot of things, it's, hey, I read some cool article about what, you know, cool company X does, let's do the same thing as them, right? And this, ONA is, it, it's fundamentally different. It is very much a, a data-driven decision-making mechanism. It's part of a toolbox you can use to help do that. Um, but it is something where people aren't used to seeing these metrics before. And so having someone who's very engaged who can help build up that expertise in the organization so that you can make it relevant at a first go uh, is, I think, just incredibly important to think about, um, particularly with ONA, because it does, it's not just in this lane of a single, it's not just in HR, it has implications across all different departments. And so being methodical um, about how you roll it out, I think, is uh, is. Agreed. So then how do we start? For those of us who haven't applied ONA before um, and have an interest, um, where do we begin? How do we reach out? Uh, what are the recommendations from all of you? Uh, I'll jump in because uh, I haven't spoken for a second, but uh, I couldn't agree more with what's being said. I, I want everyone who's listening uh, to understand that I of the three of us that are talking, I don't belong. I'm the one who doesn't belong. Uh, I am not an ONA expert. Like, yeah, but it's I, <laughs> I love I love ONA. I think it's incredibly important, but I'm far from an expert. And uh, I think it's really important uh, for people to understand that as we're talking about this, it seems complex, and it is complex when you get down deep into it. However, the key is not to, like Ben was just saying, the key is not to do some incredibly complex analysis that looks cool and sounds cool, that's in a big black box that no one actually understands. And so people are like, wow, that's really cool, but I have no freaking idea what you want me to do with that. That's not, that, that's it. one of our guiding principles at LinkedIn in our people analytics function is insights without impact equals overhead. Um, and so you can you can do all the analyses you want, uh, and if you're not actually driving impact, then you're you're worthless essentially. That's probably too strong to say it. I like insights without impact equals overhead. It's probably a better way to say it. But um, that's I think where I would like to come in in this conversation really is is kind of where Mikhail and Ben were just going, which is find some way. And, there, and, and Ben kind of hit two ways, which two kind of different paths. One is if no one in your organization knows what the heck ONA is, then do a, do a 
and you need to get some influence in order to, to make some inroads, um, do, do a small analysis. Do find a way to, to show something that is impacting the organization and the things that you're focused on now. Not a cool analysis, something that actually you go, hey, here's a different lens to look at what this uh, at this problem and look what we found. And people go, holy crap, that is amazing. Why haven't we been using this before, right? Uh, one of the ways we, we did that um, a while ago was uh, we just looked at a simple way to, to think about it is, you know, in the, or a lot of organizations, people ask for feedback from other people that they've worked with. And if you don't have complex tools or processes in place yet to, to really look at your ONA or, or you haven't done an, uh, a survey, we just looked at that, the feedback. Who did you ask for feedback from? Who, did, who gave you feedback? And we just looked at that as a basic, as a very basic look at, hey, here's some level of organizational network analysis or understanding of who's working with who within our organization and who's asking who for feedback, because that could even that could denote strength of relationship to some degree. Um, it, it, again, kind of for the people we showed it to and where we, where we went with it, it blew people away, because they, they'd never used that lens, to McCall, McCall's point, to think about the behaviors or the workplace in that way. And so I just really kind of the point I want to make is, uh, and I think again, Ben and Mikhail said it very well, so find a way. You don't have to do this three year massive change, you know, and put in these, these crazy systems to do ONA. It's not what this is about. Just look at what your problem, the problems your organization is trying to solve. Think about the relationships within those problems, so that different lens, and then think about how to how to essentially focus on on those relationships through O and A. And I can guarantee you have some way to think about that or that analysis um, with a different lens than you are looking at it today through some of the more um, you know focused data. It's uh, really just taking those small steps. I think is is key and thinking about it differently, which is why I think uh, what what we've been talking about so far is awesome, is because it's it's essentially helping people take that first small action and not waiting till you have, you know, you hire your O and A expert. Um, it's uh, you know one of the guys on my team. I gotta say this, I, I probably shouldn't, but it, it's a. Uh, he, we were talking about ONA, this is a while ago, is Shajat Ahmed, and he wrote on my board, uh, hashtag OMG before ONA. Um, and it was this, again, it's just this like, before you get there and you think it's, you take a step back and look what you're, the problems you're trying to solve and think about the relationship and apply that lens, the relationships within that problem and apply that lens. Uh, and it's pr pretty amazing the things that you'll, you'll be able to find pretty easily. Right. Ben, did you have something you want to add there? Yeah, I did. Have, I did want to add, just add on to that. That I think there's two things. So first is that, um, and so David is just getting at this. That especially as you are starting to get um, just familiar with the concepts of O and A, um, there are many different areas where it can be applied. Right? It can be applied to diverse inclusion, to look at the types of networks that men and women have. It can, again, be applied to leadership development. It can be applied to workplace decisions. There's a whole variety of areas it can be applied to. And so you need to gain that understanding. Um, but just, again, those applications are quite broad. Um, and I would say that, in my opinion, there is, of course, a, you know, methodologically, you or whoever you're working with to do your first, uh, you know, first go at ONA needs to be familiar with the mathematical concepts behind it, which are actually fairly simple. Um, again, as people after this get into this, fundamentally all it is is representing, again, it depends if these are skills or people, but it's you're looking at a matrix. So it's like people, people, how much do they communicate or do they know each other or whatever. It, and you're looking at those patterns, fairly simple. Um, but you're deriving complex metrics from that. But I would say I don't think you need to necessarily, once you have that base understanding as a practitioner, I would say you need to start targeted rather than small. It could be small, but I think I more think that the problem itself has to be targeted, right? Don't say we're going to apply ONA to every HR decision we make. 
we're going to apply it to understanding the impact of this new diversity and inclusion training program we're rolling out. Period. That's great. It could be the entire company, right? But it could be you're working on it. Instead, you're working on a problem again with just the leadership team. And that's, and that's fine, right? Um, but more, I, I think that targeted nature rather than the exact size, um, because there are some interesting things that happen at larger sizes and it's not mathematically more complex. I think that's an important way to, to think about your first foray into it. Amen, Ben. That was I uh, totally agree. And I, I would add something from a different angle to this. I think it's very, very important to experiment and to to have your hands and start um, rubbing into things. With that, I also think that I also think that um, again, there are things that if you. Ben, you said it's math. There, the, you know, you need to know the mathematics of it. But I think it's. I, I'll add a layer to that. You need to know how the mathematics are relevant to these type of relations. Absolutely. Uh, so you, we can have hindrance relationships and be central in that, right? Or we can be um, in the leadership network central, and and that that means two completely different things. If you know. Uh, you know, if I ask who, who would you avoid going and asking for any help from, and that person becomes central, right? So we need to understand that the centrality in this type of network is not uh, a positive thing. And how do we translate, for example, like we said before, contagion? Because networks don't work only in direct ties, also in indirect ties. And how do we take that into consideration and what types of, of flows flow uh, in what types of weights that we have in research for different types of resources that flow. So I think there's really a lot, um, a lot to like, because there are so many applications. And again, we see it all over the world, right? We start with a domain and then we go in siloed knowledge within because the knowledge just expands and expands. And I think ONA is one of those domains where knowledge just exponentially um, grow all the time. And now it, it just, it, it grows. It, I don't know. I've been in this for so many years and I just suddenly, it, it just, it goes more and more and more. It's like out of control <laughs> in a certain way, which is good. But we also need to, to understand now the nuances uh, with, within this uh, wealth of, uh, of ONA possibilities, really understand the nuances uh, within each one. And another angle is relational data is very sensitive to people. Uh, people are afraid to be at the periphery of the network, to be the ones that people don't consult with or don't turn to. It's easy to be at the center of a network, but it's harder to be in the periphery. And there is, you know, uh, a safety, a psychological safety also to think about because it, it well, I, I always say it taps into our belly, into our belongingness needs as humans, right? It's one of our, like our most basic needs is to be a part of the social structure that we are, that we come to work every day and, you know, spend most of our time at work. So also when, when you do it internally, think about who will see the personal data of their colleagues. Um, sometimes this can be tricky and, uh, just for that, sometimes it's good to bring like someone else just to analyze it even or to give people the understanding that no one is going to to see your personal data or if they do, what are they going to do with it? If you do do it internally, communicate, communicate, communicate. Who is going to see the data? Why are they going to see the data? What are they going to do with the data? Do I have a chance to lose my job if I'm in the periphery? You know, I, I might feel a little bit different. Uh, so we can also have unwanted consequences. Um, and I think it's important to think of these as well and to understand there's something about relational data that touches into our bellies. Um, um, that. Um, that goes along with the question that was just posted uh, around the privacy of ONA. So the question, uh, thank you for that, two minutes ago. Uh, Udo Ernest Tanner it says, uh, could you discuss maybe the issue of privacy in ONA and the different perceptions across cultures? 
uh, would be curious on the different views from the panel. Um, so I know that has to do a lot with the data as well, um, not just the relational and where you fall there. Um, Michal, that was a great perspective, but mm -hmm. if someone, uh, maybe Ben, you want to start with that and then we'll go around? Yeah, I'll kick off a little bit with that. Um, I, I mean, I think that um, this kind of data is incredibly sensitive and Michal, you just touched on it um, and I think in a very important way. There's, uh, there's a real question about who should have access to this data, who should be able to see the analysis results as well. Um, I'd say it's particularly true, at least from my perspective, Michal, I'm curious in your perspective, at least with behavioral data, because on a survey, like I could choose to not answer it or I could answer it in a different way, right? Um, when it comes to behavioral data, though, that's actually what I do at work, right? And something like email also feels qualitatively different than, for example, if you look at sensor data and what is the face-to-face -face interaction network feels different qualitatively. Right. Um, then, you know, what is the email or chat or calendar, you know, meeting network look like within a company? Um, and again, part of this gets to the, you know, the problems you're trying to answer. But at a basic level, if I'm trying to like a lot of the work that I do is at least across very large organizations. So you know, tens of thousands or even over 100,000 people and some of our customers. Um, and our customers are trying to look at the impact of very large people decisions that they're constantly making and also see are there big changes in the health of the organization over time. And, and I think it's important for to answer a lot of those questions, you really don't need access to, I don't need to know people's names, um, I don't need email addresses, I, um, like, again, you, you don't even need data at the individual level, you need to look at trends and distributions, right? And so, even if you're doing this yourself as a company, so if you're like David and you're on an you know, internal team that's doing this internally, uh, or you're like us and we're providing a technology that does this externally, I think having very well-defined boundaries between and just steps in processing and around who has access and not to that data um, is incredibly important. Um, just something that we do is we never collect, like literally on our servers, like we don't get access to email data, to um, to names, all of that is essentially anonymized on our on a customer server. Um, but then also, whenever we provide data points back, there have to be at least three people in each data point. Um, and the idea there is that, um, again, it still gives you team level perspective and things like that, but really it's these larger distributions we're going for. Um, it's something there is different sensitivity in different um, uh, in different uh, part places around the world. Um, you know, certainly for our customers in Asia, they typically, um, a lot of cases, they, uh, not a lot of cases, there are some cases where they might want some of those individual insights, but that scale is just not what we do. Um, I do think, again, though, if I'm going towards, I'm trying to coach a leader on, you know, how to better improve their network to improve the effectiveness of the organization, I would need data sort of at that level, right? But I think being very intentional about who, like, is it my day? Is it me as an individual? Is it the organization who owns that? And just being very clear up front about that and very transparent with everyone in the organization is so important because if you do that wrong, right, then any benefit you get from ONA is going to be dwarfed by the negative reaction that people will legitimately have. Um, again, I've written a bunch of articles on this. So I have fairly strong opinions on this, but I, I think that this is, don't just do what's legal. Let me put it that way, right? Like legal is, that's a weak cop out in the sense that, you know, you have basically no regulations, right? Um, and even in Europe, things like GDPR are not written, you know, they're, they're, they of course apply in the workplace, but they, they're not strong enough in my opinion because of the inherent power differential between an employer and employee. And so you gotta be very careful about what you're doing. Um, and I would encourage everyone to, for, you know, as you start to get more serious about this, to form an ethics committee and things like that. We can talk about this a lot more, but um, again, that's at least my take on it. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in. Yeah, uh, I couldn't. I couldn't agree more. Another one of our guiding principles is "can is not equal should," uh, and it's exactly what Ben was talking about. Just because you can do something legally or otherwise does not necessarily mean you should. The the one of the things we talk about on my team often is probably the biggest misstep. And again, I'm repeating a little bit of what Ben was was saying or inferring. One of the biggest missteps you can take from an organizational or people analytics or you know. Uh, outside company perspective is a loss of trust. 
And that comes through mistreating people's data or treating people's data in a way that, that uh, feels like you have not either, it feels uh, invasive because you haven't properly communicated and you haven't properly gone through and said, uh, this is the way we're going to treat your data. Uh, we also, at LinkedIn, we also are including uh, ways for people to opt out easily. So be very clear about what, how we're using it, what we're using it, and if you're still not comfortable, then you know, opt out, and we're totally happy with, uh, with you doing that. I think you know, Dean Carter talks about, um, he's this uh, CHRO and other things of Patagonia, but he talks about this idea of, of um, being uh, regenerative or, or adding to your employees. And one of the things that we do, we think about LinkedIn uh, from people at Alex's perspective is helping make our employees happier. And if in any way, shape or form, our employees think that we're watching them, that we're, we're uh, you know, we're looking at what they're doing, again, the way Ben was talking about it, whether it be an email or their calendar data or the way Michal was talking about it, they're on the outside, the, they're on the periphery of the network. Um, God, that is not regenerative. That sucks the life out of people. And that is something we want to avoid at pretty much at all costs. I'd rather us not do something uh, at all then do something that feels invasive uh, because I think that is, to me, it's, it's kind of the avoid at all costs. And I think one more, th one more place I'll go is, you know, within an organization we do, and it's a little bit different from the external, but we do have to have access at some level to individuals and to individual level data. And the, and the reason for, for that is because we got, we got to tie it, right? We're going to look at one thing and we want to tie it to another piece of data. We've got to tie those things. One of the things that we've been incredibly clear about is, again, what Ben was saying, that these kind of firewalls, because we don't want info, we don't want that data. It's taken us significantly longer than we would have liked to get to where we are with organizational network analysis because we have been incredibly careful with building in those walls uh, to make absolutely sure that um, when the question comes up, we can answer it sufficiently. The same way I would want if someone was using my data, which we will be using my data in this very thing, I would want to have those walls in place. Um, we would act any differently for, for other people. So I, I, from a privacy perspective, I think the can does not equal should and making sure that you're you know doing the lens, again, back to this, the lens of happiness helping your employees be happier, more engaged at work is a really important one versus I want to make my company more productive and successful. Ultimately, happiness and engagement makes your company more successful. But if you look at it from the lens of the employee versus the lens of the company, it helps from a privacy perspective a lot. I, I, I think I would uh, just add, agree and add to, to what was said. I think when we talk about privacy, we can talk about the technology of protecting and all the mechanisms for protecting the data and making sure that we don't see. That's one element. Another element is the trust that employees has have in their companies. Uh, I'm external. So I sometimes see when I get into a company um, that the trust levels in, it doesn't matter what mechanisms I will put in and will actually be there. Employees won't necessarily believe that these mechanisms mm -hmm. are there. And I got to the point where I got to sit with an employee on her data and um, she looked at me and she said, oh my God, it's really not a spying uh, system. It's really for my growth. And I said, yes, we communicated the entire way. You set your own password. You are the only one who could access this. No one else has. We, we put it from the beginning on everything. But still, it, until I sat with her and she got her data for herself, looking at it, she it, there was something there that just there it clicked. And that moment there, I realized that I could put all the mechanisms of privacy in the world, but this thing of trust between employees and their and their employers is a critical element in 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 using ONA. And more than that, I would say that last final piece for me that is not really about privacy, but
but it relates in the like in the ecosystem of privacy is the value to the employees themselves. So if we collect data, and it's not about ONA, this is in general, uh, we have a lot of data. What value do we produce for that? We produce that data from employees. What can we give back? What are we bringing back to employees? How do we create value at all levels uh, using that data? And, um, and then it's easier for the trust to build and then it's easier to for the methodologies to work because there's trust that was built on the value also and the reciprocity of using that data to create co like value for everyone. I think that's, and if I could just add, um, what I really like about is, I mean, I, I essentially think there's a lot of pre-work you can do on the privacy front before you, and you should before you apply ONA because of the sensitivity of it. Um, that's why it's so important when you start to target something that is relevant to the organization where you can show results where people can then understand the impact again obviously ideally also give them direct value from that because then if you say oh well we're using ona to evaluate the impact of our office move and we were able to actually change our layout to make us interact like collaborate better and that's what you did it wasn't like you were looking at what you know what ann was doing two three on tuesday that's not what you were doing you were looking at this big thing Okay, that makes sense. You, it helps people understand more about, again, it's like ONA, I don't know what that is. No, here's what it is. And here's something we tangibly did that helped improve the work environment. Great, if you keep doing those things, it's gonna be easier to do the, you know, the more impactful, the more powerful things um, because you build up that trust. Um, but again, if you choose, if you just go on a fishing expedition because you're like, hey, this is some cool methodology and I just wanna see some stuff, it's going to be a lot harder to, to build that up. Yeah. Great. We've talked a lot about um, collecting the data, the privacy of the data, um, creating value, you know, understanding what the desired outcome should be. Um, David, can you describe how you would measure ONA effectiveness? What, what would, when you, when you talk about the employee happiness, what does that, what does that look like? What does success look like? Yeah, um, I can do it very simply, and then uh, probably Ben and Mikhail have probably some more, um, you know, cooler answers. But I think uh, for me, it's it's keeping it super simple is uh, the ROI of the actions we're taking. That's it's the impact, right? So so I, I don't have a specific when I look at centrality or to me, all that is important in terms of understanding ONA. But really, it's Am I measuring the thing that the actual impact of the program or the or the initiative that I'm putting into place? That's that's all. That's really what I want to know. And if ONA is the best way to measure that, then then I should be using that. If there's another way to measure it that's better that measures that uh, to help me understand the impact, I should be using that. But it's a I think, and, and Ben uh, focused on this at the beginning when we we're talking about the simplicity of, of and and the focused or targeted um, nature uh, to to drive success with ONA. It's really about uh, understanding what before, what the success metrics are surrounding what you're trying to do instead of fishing. And, and I mean, again, you come back to privacy. You can't. You just can't. You can't do that and and stay within the bounds of privacy that I think employees are are more are expecting more and more uh, today. And so it is about okay, what is the issue we're trying to solve? What are the success metrics uh, or what are the success metrics surrounding that issue and how do we nail that specifically using ONA and once once um, we have that clearly defined then uh, that's where success comes from not from again the, the fishing and the and just looking for cool stuff to talk about is is exactly the wrong way to go also one more quick thing um, what Michal was talking about around employees and, and adding value. This is all related, right? It's when I'm looking at these things, if I'm looking specifically for how do I make my employees happier, more productive, more successful, and those are my success metrics, um, and, and I'm doing the analysis, I'm using your data for that purpose, it's so much easier to say, hey, this is, this is what we do. We're trying to help you. Because we know that if you're happier and, and more engaged, 
essentially that you're going to, you know, work is going to be better. LinkedIn is going to be more productive and successful, et cetera. But our focus is on you. Then again, the analysis and those success metrics, that lens that you use is, is, is different. And it really has helped us and driven success. And, and in some ways it's slowing us down. Right. And that's okay too. Like, like chill, slow down a little bit, do the right thing for the employees uh, to help them, to help make more, them more happy and engaged. And, uh, I, and I guess the other side of that is any small misstep, it, it, it's going to suck bad and losing trust. It's so much faster. You, you're going to lose. Once you lose trust, it's going to, it takes you so very long to get it back. Uh, any misstep on that front would be disastrous. Um, yeah, for me, I, I add to, to David and we discussed it before, ONA is a part of the process. Uh, data is not effective or not effective. Uh, data is data. And uh, ONA, uh, it's, I think maybe it's important to say, maybe we didn't say it, and ONA at the end of the procedures, you get basically descriptive data. So ONA, yes, it's advanced analytics, but it's still in the realm of giving uh, uh, descriptive uh, 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 metrics that you can then connect into and insert into predictive models and then use them to connect to other and to see how they go ahead. But by themselves running an ONA and, and thinking, okay, I run an ONA, is it effective? So it depends on did you put it in a process and was the pro did the data help you drive the process more effectively rather than asking if ONA is effective as a standalone but rather looking at what you wanted to achieve and did it help you achieve it and open that lens for you that you didn't have before and I'll give just some examples right we talk about leadership that's a relational construct uh, it has a leader, there's a follower, there's a relationship there. That's a relational construct. So far, we never measured it with relational data. Uh, collaboration, culture, social capital, those things are essential to businesses today. And those are all relational. So it, uh, it's not only that ONA is effective, this is our way to look at places that we've never looked at before that we didn't touch we didn't manage them we didn't touch them we call them soft right leadership and culture and collaboration we call them soft but now we have an analytical it's not now it's actually you know it's been years that the tool exists but again i think that the times are calling for um for more collaborative networked work and that's why the tool is becoming more and more relevant and not using it is just a missed opportunity uh, to bring that lens into the processes that you care about and you want to promote, um, such as collective leadership or leadership at scale, such as collaboration, such as culture, all of those soft things. So. <laughs> Um, but there's also, but Ben will, I'm sure we'll have that the more. Uh... <laughs> Just if I can add, we have uh, two minutes. All right. So I'll, I'll be, yeah. and we can wrap up. I mean, again, I, I think both Michal and David said it quite well. I mean, ONA, it's a, it's a tool. So saying it's effective or not, what's the effectiveness of it is, again, it's like, it's pretty grasped by itself. Um, I can say though that the social side of work is so unoptimized that if you're able to even do simple analyses with ONA and build it into your culture, the kinds of benefits you see are in some cases equivalent to it. I'm like not exaggerating going from using pen and paper to write memos to using computers, like order of magnitude. Um, just because again, like the idea of seeing, Hey, I've got one, you know, I've got one call center where turnover is, you know, over 60% a year and know that it's 20%, right? And you're able to see actually the, when people are on more cohesive teams, like turnover is way lower. And because of that, I implemented some change and was able to actually drive it down by 20%. Like that's huge and worth ungodly lots of money. Not to mention the fact that you're making where people work better. Right? Yeah. So many things like that. And I think that really the, the promise of ONA is to make all of these things that today 
people feel are soft and that will only invest in if they believe a story. Right? But if you can say, you should have a better workplace because here's quantitatively what it gets, which importantly is not performance. Right? Changing the workplace, changing anything about the way you manage a company changes the way people work. It does not change your output. And so I think that you know, essentially what ONA is providing are the KPIs for the business in the future. And that the cost for not doing it now is not building that into your culture and just being way slower than your competitors. And so I think that's why it's important to do that. Fantastic. Anyone else want to close it out? It's I can't believe it's been an hour already. It's four o'clock. I tried to go on top of what Mikhail and Ben just said. There's no way to top that. I think that's a perfect way to end. Great. Great. Thank you all. Thank you, Enrique, for um, organizing this panel again and for putting together this conference. Uh, with that, we'll end this uh, session, this breakout. And thank you so much. Thank you, Dana. Thank you. Take care. Bye.